So it's good to see everyone out this morning. Uh, I know we've got a, a large number of us missing. Um, I was asked to do the sermon in um, place of Stephen um, while Clint took the class. So you will see here very shortly how well we do. Clint's already done well. Now I just kind of follow up with that. I'd like to welcome you, each and every one of you, and let you know I am pleased to have you join me with a study of God's Word in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. We are told to study to show thyself approved unto God, workmen who are not ashamed of the Word of God, but able to rightly divide the Word of truth. We also see in uh, Acts chapter 17 and verse 11 a perfect example of that by the way of the Bereans. It says they were more noble-minded in the fact that they chose to search the scriptures daily to see whether or not the things that were being taught to them were true or not. You have the responsibility and you have the right to question anything that goes on in this congregation, anything that goes on behind this pulpit. You have that uh, responsibility to question those things if you were to see something that does not go with, uh, along with the Word of God. Uh, this morning I'd like for you, if you will, please turn to... First Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 18. First Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 18. And as we start to read this, uh, there are a, a key phrase that I want us to look at. And we're going to base our uh, sermon today around, around that. I'll back up just a little bit. And I'll start in verse 17. And that is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 17. But we, brethren, having taken away from you uh, for a short while in person, not in spirit, were all the more eager with, uh, with great desire to see your face. For we wanted to come to you. I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. And I want to look at that phrase today, and that is about Satan hindering us and how Satan hinders us, how Satan hinders mankind, from following the Word of God. Uh, and as we look at these points, I hope to, uh, to make that um, clear. Satan hinders men today by encouraging, first of all, diversions. Now, if there's any generation here recently that can say that, it is certainly this generation. We have diver uh, diversion, you know, look over there, don't look at this, worry about that, don't worry about this. We've had this pandemic for uh, over a year now. Uh, gas shortages, prices going up, taxes and all the election and all the things that went along with it and all that is is a diversion to get you to worry about those things and not worry about your own soul and so here are a couple of uh, scriptures that uh, we're going to look at in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 34 says and even if our gospel is veiled it is veiled to those who are perishing in whose case the God of this world was blinded from, with the minds of the unbelieving, that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so we see, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. And so we certainly don't want to be those who are perishing. Is there any way I can turn that off? <laughs> that is... I didn't even ask the question. I didn't want to be a diversion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, the new technology. that was going on behind me. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. And so what we see is that those who are not focused in on the Word of God, they are perishing. It is veiled to those in whose case the God of this world has blinded their minds. He has diverted their minds to something completely different. In other words, He is trying His best to say, look over there. There's really nothing here. 
whenever the most important thing that you have going on in life is your obedience to God in your own soul. And we talked a little bit about that in this morning's uh, class as well. And a lot of this morning's class will kind of go hand in hand with what we see here in the fact that con uh, congregations get diverted in the fact of what their first love is and what their mission is, what their goal is. And we'll talk about one of those that we didn't talk about this morning here very uh, briefly, shortly. Um, and we also see in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, do not love the world nor the things in the world. Anyone, <clears throat> if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And the world is passing away and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. There are three different paths of sin that you can go down. And that is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. You go down one of those paths and it will take you away from verse 17. An understanding that the world is passing away and also its lust. All three of those things will take you and divert you from the will of God. And that abides forever. However, this sin, these things that we are so easily entrapped in, what do they do? They take us and lead us down a path that is passing away. And it has been asked of me before, well, what is it be the boastful pride of life? I can only give you what my definition or the best definition I've heard of what pride is, and that is the refusal to make necessary correct uh, character change, yet expecting everyone else to do it. And so you have to have some self-exploration, and in order to do that, you have to be focused on that. You can't be diverted to something else. And all these diversions that go on in our world, and the chaos, and everything else that goes on, we cannot be focused on those things. We also see that in James chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, it is said in very strong languages, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the Spirit which He has made to dwell in us, but He gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And that makes more sense whenever you look at that definition that I gave of pride. And that is my refusal to make character change that is absolutely necessary in order for me to be happy with God. And for God to be happy with me. And yet I expect everyone else to do it. But what we see here also is that, and I think this is a sermon of its own, do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose because there's a lot of things that people just kind of throw out and pretend it ain't even there. Do you think that God just put these in there for no purpose at all? But I digress. So what we find is He jealously desires the Spirit which He's made dwell in us. He gives a greater grace. But you cannot be diverted from the focus of what's the most important thing in your life. But we do see that is exactly how Satan hinders men. He encourages those diversions. He also uh, encourages delusions. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, Jesus says this, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is, is cut down and thrown into the fire, so then you will know them by their fruit. There is no reason for you to be lied to, is what he says there. That you can see someone and their fruit that they continue to produce and know exactly what kind of tree it is. People do a lot of talking, but it is actual works that produce the fruit. And we also see that we don't need to be uh, hindered by any kind of delusions that these false 
uh, prophets uh, come along. We also see this in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. People are going to tell you a lot of things. But test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And we, we, we could read just scores of them. Even modern day prophets. There's a test that you give them. And the test is to see whether they are from God. Now, how would I know whether or not somebody is speaking the things of God? The Bereans were more noble-minded in that they searched the Scriptures daily to see if the things that were spoken to them were true. And do you know who they were questioning? The Apostle Paul. And that was stated about them because they went to the Scriptures. They were not just going to take Paul on what he said. They were going to take God on what he said. We must do the exact same thing. Satan encourages these delusions. He encourages these lies and everything else to go on around us. And that is to hinder you from doing what God wants of you. We also see in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15, notice this, for such men are false prophets, they are deceitful workers. So they're not just people who just say something, they're actually working. They're deceitful workers disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their deeds. So there are going to be a lot of people that come up to you and say, I'm a servant of righteousness. But we see, again, looking at the Word of God, what they say and what they do, what fruit that they have, there's no need for you to be hindered by any of these delusions that go on in people's uh, lives and in your own life. We also see a couple of things here, and that is Satan hinders men today by encouraging diversions, delusions, and then also doubtful minds. Now as we kind of move through this, we've been studying a lot of this in our Wednesday night class when we've been talking uh, about the book of John. We see that in Romans chapter 14, verses 22 through 23, the faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. Now the immediate context of Romans chapter 14 is the eating of meat, certain meat. Some people are going to feel comfortable with it, some people are not going to feel comfortable with it. You, and what we find in Romans chapter 14 is that Christianity is broad enough that it can include a lot of diverse backgrounds. And Romans 14 talks about that. But here's the thing that I want to focus in on Romans chapter 14. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Do not have a doubtful mind. And I'm going to go ahead and tell you, if you obey the gospel because your parents did, that is not your own conviction, that is their conviction. If you obey the, the will of God because your friends did, that is not your own conviction. If you obey the, the, uh, the gospel just because you want to look good in the community, that is not your own conviction. And what we have to find is this. The faith which we have has to be our own faith and it has to be before God. We will find ourselves in a very happy place when we do not condemn ourselves in what we approve. Now specifically he's talking about food, but that goes along with every aspect of your life. Do not have a doubtful mind. And if you have a doubtful mind, it's time to back up and say, well, why is this doubt here? i got to get rid of this doubt. We also see something else. In John chapter 10, I told you I'd go there. John chapter 10 and verse 24 through 26 the Jews therefore gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? And we know this is much later. After all of these miracles and signs and wonders, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. 
What Christ says here is this. These people have very doubtful minds. All of the evidence of all of these signs, all of these wonders, everything that He did proved that He was the Christ. And all of those signs and all of those wonders that they were looking for that He performed were for naught. And the reason for that is because they continue to question, continue to question, continue to question. They still have doubt. So those doubtful minds, we have to put aside. And we have to accept the fact of the evidence. Whenever a scripture is given to us, and we know that we are falling inside of that scripture, and that we are in sin because of that scripture, it's time to take a step back and wonder why. Stop doubting and questioning and trying to justify Instead, what we ought to do is find ourselves the way that um, John chapter 20 and verses 30 through 31 says. Many other signs, therefore, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. I have to see a miracle before I believe. That's what Thomas said. But John says, I'm writing these down so that you'll believe. And I have often heard it said before, Mike, you must have the weakest faith of any Christian I ever heard to believe that miracles don't exist. I turn to this. All of those things, all those signs, those wonders, those miracles, all of those have been written that I may believe that Jesus is the Christ. You say you have to see it in order to believe it. I read it and I believe it. Who has the weaker faith? You must remove the doubt. Signs and wonders have already been confirmed. They have been written down so that you may believe. Those are the only signs and wonders that you will ever need. That's what John says here. Remove that from your doubtful mind. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, it says, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And that's really where the crux of a lot of doubt comes from. I don't really know what's on the other side of death. I don't know whenever I die what's going to happen. I can't tell you what it's going to be like, if it's going to be the big long line that we're all waiting in to be judged. And you know, I don't know any of that, but I do know this. He who promised is faithful. And however he brings that about, I need to remove any kind of doubt that hinders me from following him. And so we see that Satan hinders men today by encouraging diversions, delusions, doubtful minds, and also double minds. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 24, which we mentioned this morning in class, it says this, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot live your life on the fence. That's a divided person. And I can tell you many times, I am a broken man inside. And I know that if you're honest, a lot of times you are as well. You're a broken person, and you try to live this life of, of balancing on the, on the beam. But Christ said you have to go through that. You cannot be double-minded. That is what hinders you. And so we have to learn to fall on one side or the other in order to have joy. You can only serve one or two masters. Elijah asked it this way. In 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21, Elijah put it this way. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. But if Baal, follow Him. But the people did not answer him a word. These people were double-minded. They wanted to say the right things, but they didn't want to do the right things. They wanted to be known as faithful followers of God, but they didn't really want to do those things. I mean, after all, who wants to be hunted down after, you know, 
from Jezebel and the prophets of Baal and all that. I mean, these people are just nuts. I mean, they're cutting themselves and everything else. So they halted and they were hesitated between two opinions. And that's really what it boils down to. You either follow God or you follow mammon. James chapter 1, verse 5 through 8 says this. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man unstable in all of his ways. Now, there's a lot spoken inside of here. And that is someone who doubts, someone who has a double mind, who sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that. They're trying to ride on that fence, just like all of us do. Whenever you're like that, you are just like a wave that is being tossed to and fro, just depending upon the wind. Whichever direction the wind is going, you ever been to the ocean and kind of see it kind of calm and just a little bit? And then a storm's coming in. What that looks like? Well, that's the way we are a lot of times. Sometimes it's nice and calm. Sometimes we're all excited. And it's just because of every wind that kind of comes along that pushes us where we need to go or where it wants us to go. We cannot be driven like that. Because what it says is this, that you are like a double mind, you are a double-minded man, and it says you are unstable in all of your ways, not just the ways of God. It just seems like you're off balance every single aspect of your life. And every endeavor you ever try to take, you become unstable. You cannot be that way. You must be focused, and that is exactly how Satan hinders us by encouraging this. He encourages diversions. He encourages delusions, doubtful minds, double minds. He also encourages us in deadness. In James chapter 2, verses 26, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. It just doesn't get any simpler than that. You can have all the faith in the world that you want. And you can talk and you can live a bumper sticker religion that has these cute little slogans all over the place that will never replace an act, a work, something that you put your hand to. You're living in a dream that will never come to pass. Even all of your endeavors Whenever that you can plan out and plan out and plan out, you know, if you ever build a house, you can do all the planning, but until someone starts working, it never comes to pass. It's a dead, it's dead. And that dream dies right there with the lack of work. And we cannot be that way. We have to understand that just as the body without the spirit is dead, faith without works is dead also. We also see this in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Here's what happens. Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we shall do if God permits. Now, these are people who are suffering from deadness. They've gotten comfortable with where they are in their knowledge. They've gotten comfortable with where they are in their relationship with God. They just kind of stop. Now, there was a congregation that we talked about this morning about that. In Revelation. And that is Ephesus. And they had lost their first love. Well, that's exactly what he's saying here. Let me ask you this. How long have you been in the body of Christ? And how many of you could teach about these very elementary teachings about repentance? If someone says, well, what is repentance? What verses would you turn to to show them exactly what repentance is? Here's, here's, here's your verses on repentance. What if someone says, 
of faith, which ones would you turn to? And you may know some. What about the instructions about washings? That's also translated baptisms. Because there's more than one. I mean, some people say, you know, I mean, I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Could you teach that? Could you teach against that? Could you teach for it? Could you? How would you teach that? What about this? The laying on of hands. What's that all about? Where would you go to and how would you teach someone about that? The resurrection of the dead. What verses come to immediately just like that? I just know them. Eternal judgment. What would you say to someone who has no clue about eternal judgment? What verses would you turn to? And if you're struggling in any of these things, understand this. These are elementary teachings. Very basic foundational teachings. And that's where these people were stuck and I hope that you are not stuck there. And that you can teach. And if you are newer, then these are the very things that you need to be studying because this is where your faith lies. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 15, he says this. God gave us some cer uh, cer certain gifts. And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. And this is for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the statue which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be tossed we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. These apostles wrote down, these prophets prophesied, evangelists preach. We also see that pastors, they are the one who leads. The, the elders, they are the one who leads. We have teachers who teach the Word. And all of this, and all of these people exist for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. Satan encourages deadness in that. In the work of the service. But when you work and you do the work of the service that God has asked you to, notice what happens to the building up of the body of Christ. And we continue to do all of that until we all attain the unity of faith. He goes on to say, as a result of all this work and all this knowledge of the Son of God and all this maturing that starts to happen, happen and to the measure of a statue which belongs to the fullness of Christ, as a result of all of that that goes on, you should not remain as a child in Christ. Children of Christ who are brand new, babes in Christ, are tossed about by every wind of doctrine that comes along because they are very hungry for stuff. And they search every single Google search they can to find out about this subject and that subject and they are tossed about by every wind of doctrine that comes along. But this exists to stop that. But if you are still tossed to and fro by every single wind of doctrine that comes along, you're not taking advantage of the, the uh, process in which God has ordained. And it shows deadness. We also see something else, and that is Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. We didn't get to this congregation, but it says this to the angel of the church of Sardis, right? He who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name that you are alive, but you're dead. Wake up. Strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die. For I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. Remember therefore what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. If therefore you will not wake up, I will come like a thief 
and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. In other words, God is able to surgically remove the righteous ones. Those who are working, those who are continually growing, those who are not dead. You can have a good name about yourself. That does not mean that you're alive. It doesn't mean that you're awake. What we see here is a stark reminder of who we are. And a stark uh, red flag that we need to ask ourselves, would I fall in this category? We also see that Satan hinders by diversions, delusions, doubtful minds, double minds, deadness, and last delay. This is probably the greatest tactic that Satan has on mankind. Delay, delay, delay. Because we know, or he knows, and we ought to know by all the warnings that our time is very short. And if he can delay, he can get you to delay, he can hinder you, you slip into eternity without salvation. In Luke chapter 9, verses 59 through 62, it says, And he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Permit me first to go and bury my father. But he said to him, Allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. And another also said, I will follow you, Lord. But first permit me to say goodbye to those at home. But Jesus said to him, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And these conversations that are having and these excuses that are given just seem to be Christ saying this is not an excuse and we would think these are very reasonable requests that these people are making I, I do but you see what Christ is saying here there is no moment of delay that you have in Acts chapter 24 and verse 25 it says this, and he was discussing, as he was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix said exactly what a lot of people say. He becomes frightened and he said, go away for the present, and when I find time, I will summon you. And we always try to say that, don't we? When I find time. Well, here's the thing, time is in front of us. There is no searching for it. You don't have to look for it. It's always presently there. You just have to stop whatever it is that you're doing and make it a priority in your life to follow God. But all of this delay and all of this, all of this stuff that we've been talking about, it is nothing but hindrance to you to keep you away from doing what God wants. In Matthew chapter 26 or 25 and verse 8 through 13 and this is the um, the parable of the bride's waiting for the groom and the foolish said to the prudent give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out they weren't prepared but the prudent answered no there will not be enough for us and you too go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves and while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. And later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he said, and he answered and said, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. A lot of people go through life not prepared to slip into eternity. They continue to put it off. Delay, delay, delay. You can justify it. You can try your best to say this is a good thing to wait on. Whatever it is. But you do not know when that day is coming when all of a sudden you're having to give an answer for everything that you've done in life. It doesn't matter how young or how old you are. 
And I could go through the scriptures and we could turn through Genesis and read all those funny names that none of us can pronounce. And it says, and he died. 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 And it's just over and over and over again. He may have lived 950 years, but he died. You know what it says about Abraham, the most faithful of all? He died. You know what happened to David in the end? He died. And those are who we're trying to compare ourselves to. We are not going to escape this. There is no reason for delay. Satan hinders men today by encouraging diversions, delusions, doubtful minds, double minds, deadness, delay. And really, the question is Satan hindering you? And there may be some other tactic he's using in your life, but he is hindering you. And you know if he is or not. And as I said before, these are just some of the tactics. I mean, we're talking about somebody who's pretty wily and pretty crafty here. They can kind of slide these things into our lives and us not even realize it. These delusions, these lies, these... You know, we, we live in a delusional mind if we think that we're not going to have to answer for our lives. So are you being hindered? In Mark chapter 16 and verse 16 we are told, He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. We also see that we are to repent. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 it says this, And Peter said to them, they were asking, What must we do? in order to have the gift of God. Peter said to them, Repent and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You must turn away from the life that you are currently living. We also see we are told to confess. And in Acts chapter 8 is a perfect example of that. Philip said, he was talking to the eunuch, and he says, you know, well, what do I need to do? And so Philip starts to teach him. And he says, well, here's water. What, what hinders me from being baptized? And Philip says this. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then you know what happened after that? He orders the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. Of course, we see also you're supposed to be baptized. In 1 Peter chapter 3, in verse 21, it says, and corresponding to that, and that that here is about Noah being saved by water. And corresponding to that, and corresponding to Noah being separated from the wickedness of the world, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh. It's not a bath that you take. But it is an appeal to God for a good conscience. And that's what we've been talking about. Don't be hindered by Satan to have a good conscience and being able to sleep at night. An appeal to God for a good conscience and it's through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That baptism that we're talking about puts you in direct contact with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We also see that we are told to live faithfully. In John chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus therefore was saying to those Jews who had believed in Him, If you abide in My Word, then you are truly disciples of Mine. So as we look back and look at the things that Satan hinders uh, from us, I want you to think about James chapter 4 and verse 7. Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I'd like for you to think about these things as we stand to sing the songs been selected.